was Miss T, uh, that <coughs> you don't know me. So my name is Alistair Hines. I've been here in Hampshire for, oh, it seems like a long time now, but it's since March. Um, I am one of the assistant service managers and look after development work. So I'm not operational. Uh, I don't look after individual cases or oversee anyone who looks after individual cases. I do more of the, the bits of work around that to try and make the, the, the service move forward in terms of looking after things like the EHC hub, uh, data and information, uh, and a bit to do with sort of finances and stuff as well. Um, so yes, what I wanted to, to just mention briefly uh, for some of you uh, that may not be aware of this, um, is one of the, obviously one of the things that's important for us to do uh, as a local authority in relation to uh, children with EHC plans is to uh, to oversee, review, and make a decision uh, on a child's annual review every year. Uh, now, here within Hampshire, uh, and not just here within Hampshire, it's applicable to many, many, many local authorities. Uh, annual reviews has always been a bit of a sort of weak link in the chain around statutory work. Um, it's just one of those things that across so many local authorities um, always seems to have been the sort of second point of consideration after assessments. Um, but this year in particular, uh, we're putting a, an extra focus on annual reviews, uh, which is linked to the work I do around the Education, Health and Care Hub. Uh, some of you may already be on the EHC Hub. If your child, for example, has been through assessment and received their EHC plan within, say, the last 18 months to two years, chances are you've been on the Hub uh, from the beginning uh, and your child's Education, Health and Care plan is on there already. For those who have been through the assessment process prior to the end of 2019, um, your EHC plan would have been created outside of the EHC hub. So a piece of work that's happening over the next 12 months um, is for us to slowly work through school by school to move all the children who aren't in the EHC hub onto the hub. Um, now, for you as families, that won't uh, immediately see anything particularly exciting happen. All it will mean is that come your future annual reviews, um, they'll take place in terms of from a paperwork point of view uh, within the EHC hub rather than back and forward via email from your schools and yourselves. Um, that process will move on to the EHC hub. Um, that's happening gradually, as I say, over the next 12 months, um, school by school, so that we, because what we didn't want to do when we were looking at it and thinking, well, should we do it year group by year group? But then it meant that we'd be contacting a school and saying, these three kids are moving onto the hub now. And then six months later, these four kids are moving onto the hub as well. Um, and it was easier for us and for schools to know that actually we're moving all the kids in your setting in one go into the EHC hub. Uh, to make things easier for schools so that they're not constantly having to try and remind themselves, is this kid in that class on the hub or not? Um, they'll know that everyone's there or no, or they're not yet. Um, that should make things easier in terms of uh, our decision making through annual reviews. So over the next 12 months, as we move children over, that will prompt us to look through the most recent annual review that's come in. Uh, for some people, that may be the annual review that took place uh, last year, if you've not had an annual review yet this academic year. But as you can imagine, if a, if a particular school that we're moving into the hub uh, is moving into the hub, for, say, for example, in April or May next year, chances are that a lot of the children in that school will have had an annual review between now and then. And so we'd be moving that one into the EHC hub. Uh, the aim being that from September 2022, all annual reviews should be able to then happen through the EHC hub, which makes things much easier for settings, makes things in theory much easier for families. Obviously, that's dependent on people's um, accessibility to ICT, which we're being mindful of and putting uh, alternative arrangements in place, just as we do for people who go through the assessment process already, to be able to accommodate people who struggle with access to ICT 
uh, for one reason or another, uh, and simpler for the local authority so that we can vastly improve our capacity to look through annual reviews and make decisions on whether to maintain, make changes or amend a plan, uh, or in those very few circumstances that are applicable, uh, potentially cease an EHC plan. If, for example, someone's uh, made significant enough progress that people feel uh, that a plan isn't necessary anymore. Um, so there will be information coming out about it in more detail. Uh, over the next few weeks, we'll be updating the local offer website so that there's guidance on there. Obviously, if someone has been on the hub since their child first became known to our service in the last year or so, the EHC hub for most of those families will be second nature by now, having gone through the assessment process on there. Um, but there will also be a lot of families uh, who've never been on the hub, maybe never even have heard of the EHC hub because their child uh, had an EHC plan long before it even existed. Um, so in short, to enable people to be able to do that, we'll be putting lots of information, tutorial videos, etc., on the local offer to try and make it as easy to use, accessible and understandable as possible. Um, Can I jump in for a second, being as you've just mentioned the word accessible, Alistair? Of course because you can, the, Sarah. Because I've got some feedback that's come through <coughs> saying there's been some discussions on the groups this week about the hub and how difficult it is to access, particularly for anyone with a disability. It's very user unfriendly and hard to navigate. It also doesn't have a working document function. Is there awareness from this in Hampshire? And are they planning to do anything about it? I think the accessibility thing, it has the potential to be a real challenge because, you know, that that's just making something far harder than it needs to be for you know so what what's happening about yes. making it more accessible are we are we engaging some of those groups in actually testing it so there's two elements to that so bear the first thing to bear in mind is that uh the ehc hub is not a program that is unique to hampshire um so it's not something there's certain bits of the ehc hub that we have control over as one local authority whereas lots of the other elements, including its accessibility, is managed by the parent company who owns the product. It would be a bit like, for example, uh, us saying that we feel that uh, there's some accessibility with issues with Zoom and saying, can we as, as Hampshire County Council or uh, the Parent Carer Forum make some changes to make Zoom more accessible? There's some things we can tweak about with the settings of Zoom, but actually Zoom's a product that's owned by a great big company much the same as the EHC hub, which is owned by iDocs. We are, however, part of a user group uh, that exists for local authorities uh, and feedback any issues that we find that arise, be that small logistical sort of issues that we find as a local authority, which no one else would ever know about in terms of report issues and that sort of stuff, through to these more significant issues that come back to us through users, be that families, but also through practitioners as well. We have uh, groups that we talk to through um, the various teams in education, health and care to look at uh, any issues that people are finding from a practitioner point of view as well. Um, so be very happy uh, if people have got specific issues that they are finding with it, because I know I'm aware that accessibility could be a vast range of things from how it's looking in terms of its color and contrast through to uh, it not being easy to use through things like Google Translate, um, through to it being uh, how easy it is to use with something like a screen reader. So if there's any specific issues around accessibility that come up, Sarah, uh, if you're happy to uh, sort of yeah, funnel those through when they come up. I think up. it's one of those things, isn't it, where I, <coughs> it, it would be good. I totally get your point that it's a, it's a thing that's being used everywhere. But, you know, it's better to be the shining light that's shining light on those problems and say, look, Hampshire was recognised this is an issue and, and raise them rather than just kind of sort of shove them under the table and say there's nothing we can do. So, yeah, please. Um, to those who answered the question, if there's some things that you want to feed back, please feed them back via us so that they, they can get back, because if we don't feed them back, the guys don't know. Um, yeah. And when those sort of things do come up. Uh, we make a big song and dance about them with the parent company. Uh, it's just about us being able to collate that information. So yes, anytime 
people have got that sort of feedback to pass it through. I, I've, I've got uh, another question. I've got another through. bit of feedback back from a another parent Great. saying, you know, it's it's ridiculous to have a system that's used for managing the education of neurodiverse children with a system that is not accessible for people with neurodiversity. Now, I don't have the experience to know what it is. In that. I don't use that system yet with my daughter. Um, but for those of you that do use it, if that's you, please put those bits down and, and I'll send them to Alistair because... Um, yes, please. I, I don't know I don't use it and, and I, I'm not part of that population but it is really important that you you know you feed that back of course um, and and of course the thing to bear in mind from 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 my side of things within SEN is that lots of the people that use it within S, the SEN service in terms of our employees are using it all day every day and so they're finding ways to uh, make the system work for them so they aren't always bringing up particular accessibility issues that they might encounter because they've found ways to work around them so getting that feedback from people who aren't using it on a regular basis is so important to us um, so yes thank you very much for so, yes yeah, so please do pop through, those in the Sarah. chat folks and if you've got specific comments or if at a later date you've got something specific that's coming from a group feed it back yes, to please. hpcn and we'll get them to alistair yes um, thank you Question on timescales in the hub, Alistair. Is the hub going to make the timescales work within make, within four weeks of reading the annual report from placement, as there does seem to be a problem with HCCs completing the annual review? So yes. So the as we are uploading annual reviews this academic year into the EHC hub, as I'd made reference before, some depending on when that happens for that particular school and the children there, the annual review might be a very recent annual review. So if we're uploading you after Easter, for example, chances are, well, there's a two thirds chance that you've got an annual review from this academic year that will be uploaded into the hub, uh, in which case we'll be able to make those decisions in a timely manner. And the system, much like it does for people going through the assessment process, outlines what those timescales are so people can see when we should be making those decisions. The intention behind that is that once everyone's in the EHC hub, we'll be able to coordinate much more efficiently than we do at the moment, making sure that those annual reviews are getting looked at in good time so that it's a meaningful and purposeful conversation. I understand as much as anyone else how frustrating it can be if you're getting feedback uh, on an annual review when actually you're going well actually the next annual review is in two weeks time so thanks for that actually this annual review was 11 months ago uh, so absolutely we want to be making sure that we're making those decisions in a timely manner because if we don't then they don't have as much value for you as families or schools and equally they don't hold as much value for us as a local authority either um, if actually the information we're looking at and making a judgment on is you know, six months plus old. Um, so absolutely, that's a real focus for us. A couple of points about just the logistics of, of yeah. within the hub that you may or may not be aware of. So one says it seems on the hub addresses can't include house names or numbers such as 1A. And this is already causing problems. Okay. Can this be updated? Um, so that seems one, ludicrous. <laughs> I, I can understand that. I think one thing that's happened recently um, I'm not entirely sure when it came online because I think it was just before I started. So it's either in January or February of this year. Uh, the hub has been linked for the first time to the Royal Mail database. So actually we put in someone's postcode into the system and then it gives us all of the addresses, including ones with names and numbers. I'm aware that I think before that happened, that change, there were some issues. Alex is shaking her head, so I'm guessing that means no. that Alex's address doesn't pop up properly. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, can, I can. Alex. Yeah, so basically, it does bring up all of the it brings up all of those details, but you go to select it, but it doesn't put it into the hub. It, oh. Uh, I, my address is to A. It sounds like the address um, lookup is working, but then it's not actually sends it to two. My okay. um, another contact has got a name, house name, but it leaves the line that completely. Okay. It sounds no, like no, one to take away, Alice. That sounds like a bug absolutely. in the system. Thanks, Alex. Those sort, those sort so of it, little it looks things. Like it should be working, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't actually keep that information, and it reverts back to take out any numbers at all 
you're, you're breaking right. up a bit, Alex. So I'm going to pop you back on mute. But I think the point is is relevant, and and you know, it seems like it should be. I would think that's an easy software fix. Absolutely, um, and that sort of thing, they're very quick at resolving when we flag them up. Um, this this so this one's I'll about information on the hub. Al but kind of where it goes, Alistair. So there's an email address for the case coordinator, but even though I've tried to contact them numerous times, I've had no reply. Is that because it's not getting through or I'm being ignored? Are those email addresses monitored, the ones that are on the... And are, are they updated? Because I know at my get-togethers, one of the things that's come up is that, that um, people are, are changing caseworkers and, and not knowing about it. So if a caseworker changes, do those email addresses on the hub get changed? Okay. Sorry, I know you're writing notes. Yes, just a second. Uh, I'll let you see. Rob. You're not multitask, Alistair. <laughs> but I don't want to, otherwise I'll look at the note later and go, what's that? Quite right, right. absolutely. House numbers, what about house numbers? <laughs> uh, so it's important that I try to remember. Do you want me to run that one past you again? No, so I was you... listening at the same time. Uh, so information in the hub. So the addresses and things do get updated. Um, that it's not always straight away after a caseworker has changed. So, for example, uh, we've had a caseworker who's left uh, within the last few weeks. We've recruited uh, a new caseworker to take over their cases, but that caseworker is needing to be skilled up and taught how to use the hub before we swap them over in the hub itself. So right. there shouldn't be there sh what there shouldn't be uh, is people lingering in the hub for a long, long time, sort of caseworkers that aren't here anymore. And we do go through the system periodically to try and keep that updated. Uh, do we do we catch 100 percent of those all the time? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but when people flag those sort of things to us, we do make sure to look at them. Um, but yes, the email address is, well, the name of the caseworker, the allocated caseworker gets uh, updated and the email address along with it because the email address belongs. So if people are taking that email address, we assume it's the correct caseworker. Is that the right contact to use, that email address? Is that how people should be getting in touch? Because what people are saying is, could we set aside the fact we've got the right email address? Yes. So is that how they should be getting in touch with their caseworker? Because I've got quite a few comments saying, we've been emailing but we're having no reply so co most contact that comes through the service for individual members of staff comes through district mailboxes so i'm trying i can't think of what how they're worded off the top of my head but sort of yeah. newforest.sen at hamps.gov etc and those email addresses get triaged on a daily basis um and that's where casework offers what casework offices tend to be going to look at individual bits of work to be done so if you're if you're contacting them through those district mailboxes and finding that a response is taking more than it should which is the general rule of thumb is five working days for someone to come back to you <clears throat> there are certain points in the year where we may put a notice on those mailboxes that it's taking a bit longer for example the week leading up to the 15th of February when everyone's scrabbling around to do with phase transfer. Um, th it, there's such a big focus on that piece of work that things may take a little longer. But most of the time during the year uh, is five working days from those district mailboxes. Um, so the advice and... would be to use the <coughs> district mailbox rather than the case, the named caseworker's email address? For day-to-day -day queries, yes, because generally speaking, the only queries that are going directly into alistair.hines at hamps.gov if I were a caseworker, um, as I, if I were a caseworker, which I'm not, uh, but most of the emails Andrew going into there are to do with bits of work. That's not, but that's not actually my <laughs> correct email address. <laughs> but as an example, um, that's where things to do with sort of uh, the service managerial queries and stuff are going. Uh, things to do with cases tend to go through the district mailboxes. And so if someone as a caseworker is looking for correspondence to do with a case, more often than not, they'll look within those district mailboxes. That's confusing that's though, isn't it? Because if, if within the comes. hub, that is confusing though, that if within the hub is the caseworker email addresses and then we're saying don't use them, that's, that's if rather counterintuitive. Do, generally speaking, if people use those email addresses, people should still be getting responses. Okay. Um, but what you'll often see is the response you get then comes from the district mailbox to okay. try and softly nudge you So it would be wise direction. perhaps to copy in both? Potentially, you're more likely to get a response from the district mailbox. 
because okay. that's where people are expecting where can people find the district mailboxes alistair if you go, if you google sen hampshire county council mm -hmm. it takes you to the main hampshire website and down at the bottom of that page is a table that has the name of each district and its corresponding mailbox email address and also the contact number for the help desk and well how do people know which district they are in so that which district email they should so be emailing if if you are i mean generally speaking it's it's often quite clear because it's linked to uh districts in terms of your if you're in if you pay your taxes to east hampshire district council chances are you you sit within east hampshire locality it's not completely in line with the districts that way um but if you've already got an ehc plan or are going through the assessment process your correspondence that you get should inform you which team you're from so it will have the person's name and their district on it i've got um <coughs> A comment from a parent saying i've used that website this morning and a lot of the links are broken i can evidence this if needed i would suggest um that if that person wants to evidence it they probably appreciate that um can if anybody's on a laptop you can easily find where those links are and stick a link in the chat for us that would be lovely um because then everybody else can have a look um so, um can you just repeat where it is alice so that we find it the the, the um area district mailbox addresses of course if you if you google hampshire county council sen the first page that oh, there it we comes go. up Look. with Thanks, Tom. Uh, down the bottom <laughs> I've, I've, I've got it somebody shared table. it let me oh brilliant i don't need to do that then um it's also got the number for the helpline and things as well brilliant I think it's one of those things, and I know you've probably heard me say it before, Alistair, but I, the thing that frustrates me as a parent, supporting parents, is that it's so easy for professionals to say, just Google, and you know what to Google, and we don't, and our heads are already full of so much stuff that, that the, the cognitive load of just Googling, it sounds ridiculous that that's too much, but sometimes it just really is so okay look, i've shared that link everybody if you if you can click on it from chat then it'll take you to the right place um otherwise you can actually save that chat and then hopefully we will have them um i might pick them off and actually just stick them in one of our groups so that they're, they're just there because i know alice you, you you quote them lots but they're not just something that's necessarily easy to find right i'm just going course, to but course. another another um i know we're getting very bogged down in hub so i will give us another few minutes and then i'll i know tom yeah. wants to talk to us a little bit about something that's going on with with his stuff um but i'll just see if we can knock off a few of these um a parent saying that the assessment dates on the hub for their um ehcp is wrong we've asked the caseworker to change them but it says that it can't be done but So I mean, is that something I'd have to have a look into in terms of the specifics of an individual child? Um, we know that there was a short period of time earlier this year uh, when cases in a particular circumstance inexplicably put in when the uh, an assessment request was submitted, it gave the wrong date. So we had about four or five cases that were submitted on the same day where they were submitted, I think it was sort of May 2021, and for some reason defaulted to having come in in January 2020. So it was, you know, 52 weeks had already passed from the day that the request for assessment was submitted. But you can understand um, when you're using the course, hub as your that, timeline, if, that why yes. that then so, causes a problem. Yes, and so if those particular issues are coming, uh, normally what would happen is caseworkers pass those forward through me so that I can get our provider of the system to make those corrections. Um, so if you feel that you've raised that already and it's not been able to get corrected, um, do pass me any particular details if anyone's willing to share their individual de details with you to share with me afterwards, Sarah. Okay. And I can look into the specific case uh, and raise that with the, the hub provider. Okie dokie. Thanks, right, Sarah. I mean The hub is one of those things that when you start talking about it, Alice, you think is a fairly straightforward thing and then it just goes off, doesn't it? Um, there's a section on the hub that pops up randomly to leave notes for the caseworker, case but it's hard to find when looking for it and any notes you leave disappear. Um, the only bit of that that I can think of uh, is that there's the ability to add a note to the child's timeline, which is basically like a chronology of what's happening in the hub. Um, 
that's the only thing I'm aware of. There's bits in the hub that you can add comments. For example, if you're looking at a draft DHC plan, there's comment sections to give you feedback. Um, so it, unless it's those bits, but those, I've not encountered any feedback from people saying those are a problem before. But then again, I've not had any feedback from people about the timeline being difficult to add things to either. Uh, but I'm happy to go away afterwards and do a bit of uh, user testing because I'm able to log into the hub sort of and pretend to be a parent and go and access those bits and pieces. So I'm happy to go away and look at the comments bit. Try and, and live at Meadow timeline. Cottage and uh, change the dates. <laughs> And yes, CA indeed. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll put some myself in a uh, 64A Zoo Lane or something. And uh, take your glasses off to check back. the accessibility. And uh... <laughs> and uh, right, yes, I've got I've got one that. more point, and it's Thanks, it Sarah. is it's not it's not a hub point. Um, oh, okay. it, it's more of a generic one. So um, a parent who's got um, a child on the SEN register and is waiting a draft DHCP, which is overdue. They're in a mainstream setting and okay. the setting is struggling to support their son. Can the school go to the SEN support team for advice whilst they await the draft? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, most of our schools uh, are very good at that and they will come to us and seek advice and support. They've also potentially, uh, depending whether they are uh, what's the word I'm looking for, S sort of uh, have a contract in place with the educational psychology service. They're a very able and willing uh, to give advice. And there's also other services as well. It's sort of dependent. I won't list them all off, uh, but it's sort of dependent on what the particular area of need is that they're struggling with. So, for example, if it's behaviour, we've got the primary behaviour service and things. Um, but absolutely, uh, as I say, schools often do come and do that, but if you're, uh, if you think that's something that's not happening, uh, do you know, absolutely encourage them to make contact with us. I think it goes back to us. this thing again, isn't it? What do you know? And as a parent, you don't of know course. what you need to know sometimes, and therefore you sort of, yeah. when you're talking to a school, you don't know what's out there, that you, and it's just, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so in that Thanks, case, Sarah. the school could be prompted to, to talk to you guys. Okay, of course. I think... I can let you off the hook for a bit, Alistair, because I think I've gone through everything <laughs> that I've gone there. I will obviously save this and pick out any bits yes, that need please. to come back to you. Please do, if you get a moment, anyone and want to add anything on um, or share details for me to pass on, I absolutely will. Thanks. Okay, Tom. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, th hi, everyone. I'm Tom Smith. I work in transformation within NHS commissioning. I just want to come today to talk a little bit about our new autism assessment service, which will start in about two weeks exactly. It's the uh, 1st of October and the contract starts and it's a new two and a half year service to start off with. We've procured over about a three month period earlier this year and it's got a few sort of key differences going forward. We know that it's been a long waiting list for autism assessments going back since about 2017, the, the waiting list has been rising. So we've identify quite significant funding to boost that service up and procure a service which can reduce that waiting list, reduce the waiting times, and also to offer some additional support going forward for children with or without autism, just but have been referred onto that autism diagnosis pathway. So a couple of the key benefits outside of the waiting times should be uh, we've extended the range range from, it was originally five to 18 years, it, we've now drop that down to three to 18 years or 19 if with a learning disability as well. So that's an extra two years uh, eligibility on this service. There is already the ability through paediatricians to assess for autism, but they're not always capable of assessing within the time period, which, which, which they'd like. Obviously they have caseloads that aren't just focused on assessing for autism and also are doing other work. What, one of the key points that came up with, with a lot of uh, work with our parent care organizations is the ability for some uh, follow-up sessions post-assessment so they've been commissioned to have the ability to offer a post-assessment session so it's post-assessment not post-diagnosis so regardless of diagnosis they'll have a they have the ability for a, for a session you don't have to have that session if you don't want to and this will be able to go through the report which has been produced sign poster services uh share with family the reasons why di diagnosis may not have been been reached and also linked to other services that may be more appropriate. Uh, I think that's about it to start off with. I'm happy to take any questions, but it should be a really good service and should be reducing waiting times to within national standards 
by the end of the contract, if not sooner. I've got the question probably unsurprisingly, Tom, how long is the waiting list? But I think it's interesting also what you've said about national standards. So can you tell us what the waiting list is course, and what the national standard course. is? So a bit, bit, bit of context. At the start of this calendar year, approximately, the waiting list was about 1,700 children, young people in Hampshire. It's and how now, long is that in time but, for people? Sorry. So, and that was that was approximately taking about a year and a half to sit. From, if there was to be referred then, it would have been, sorry, for the people being seen in January 21, it, they had already been waiting about a year and a half. Okay. And it, if it had continued at that rate, anyone who was referred in at that point would have been waiting over a year and a half and going on two years because that waiting list is growing. We found some additional money in the interim as well as this longer term service. So the waiting list now is almost exactly a thousand children, young people. So it's come down 700 in about nine months already due to that interim funding, which has been essentially the interim funding is, is continuing on longer term with the same sort of levels of, of money available for those assessments. So so at that, so it, we're looking at now, if you're referred in to the service right now, it's about 10 months before you're seen. And the national standards is 12 weeks. So it's still a long way to go. But as long as that waiting list keeps coming down, then the waiting times will go down with it until we reach that 12 week target. How does somebody get referred to the to That's an assessment, Tom? Great question. So, that, so as it stands currently, the, usually the main route would be through the GP and they would refer in for for an autism assessment and they have all the referral forms but that that currently goes through our CAM service and they would they would screen it essentially for any mental health needs and then pass it on to the our current provider CECON if there was no mental health primary mental health need from the 1st of October that CAM step won't be happening and if the, if the GP is referring purely for an autism assessment they will refer directly into CECON and they won't have that CAM step. If they think there's also a primary health, primary mental health need, they will refer into CAMs and CAMs can then do their own uh, assessment. And if they don't determine there is a primary mental health need, then they can pass it on to CECON. I know that's an extra step, but on that, on that part of it, we don't want to have to go back to GP again if CAMs say, say no, so they'll refer on to CECON. Uh, the other part of that is, from the 1st of October, it won't just be GPs who can refer, it'd be any health, social care or education professionals. So that includes people in schools. A lot of the, from talking to our provider, one of the, be the best sources of evidence they've got is from schools. So if we're getting more school referrals come in, it stops some of that back and forth that it has to go about, about getting, filling out questionnaires, getting school reports, that sort of thing. And will schools know how to do that? Will it be we have a, a whole lot of comms going out as Brilliant. we speak all about that. I'm sure there might be some initial uh, lack of lack of understanding just as we sort of keep pushing that message. And it won't just be we'll send out one comms message before the 1st of October and that's it. We'll continue that probably for the first few months of the, of the new service until we're, we're confident and we'll monitor how many referrals are coming in from, from schools and see how that's going. And bearing in mind, you've said that the wait was 18 months. What happens to a child who hits 18 when they're sitting on the waiting list? So... What we have previously done and we'll continue to do is we have been essentially pushing our provider when they're going towards 18 to, to move them up the waiting list, as it were, so they don't fall to the bottom of the adult waiting list. So from all of our information we get from our provider, they have very few who are 18 because they, they will be seen before that. Obviously, it's not always going to be possible, but we try and keep that the number who are 18 at essentially zero. And, and a question that... Um... So that I thought of really you said that it was 18 but 19 with a learning disability so is that where you've got somebody who's got a recognized learn learning disability and we're now we're looking for an, an autism assessment on top of that yes exactly okay, okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. what support is there in place post-diagnosis my son has recently been diagnosed but I the only support I can see is from autism Hampshire so that was what I was going to mention, and that is something we're looking at: is the the, the post-diagnostic support and see what else needs to be be put in place. We've got we're trying to what we have focused on currently, and I appreciate it's not answering the question: is the pre-diagnosis because the waiting list was so long. These would be these are a massive cohort of children with no support at all. So, Autism Hampshire can is for both pre and post-diagnostic uh, support in terms of parent workshops. The wellbeing service will do pre-diagnosis as well which is a, a a sort of low level 
SCMH, emotional well-being, working with parents and families around the needs of the needs of a child, regardless if they actually have autism or not. It's they may have traits of it, but may have not been diagnosed as of yet. But they they're right to, to point out the lack of post-diagnostic support. But that is something which will, I think, as we start getting more follow-up sessions in, I'd hope that then the our provider will come to us to see that the same things are coming up in terms of the fa families are saying they want this, but we haven't got that to offer them. And then we can start looking at what else needs to be put in place. So any... does Hampshire get funding from? Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we commission them separately. There's no, no matter if you've been diagnosed some diagnosed with autism through CAMS or through CECOM, we both have contracts with autism Hampshire for that post-diagnostic and CECOM somebody else has asked which which provider it is that's CECOM isn't it yeah so there's which the has got a funny is that the one with the really funny spelling yeah it's p-s-i-c-o-n okay so yeah so that <laughs> is that is the new service is also going to Seacon. be through CECOM silent p right indeed when I when I first started I was saying psychon 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 they quickly corrected me that apparently really it's nice easy word to read if you you know if uh <laughs> reading's not your thing isn't it completely uh right i think this is sort of what you were talking about around the 18 but if waiting lists and numbers have come down for assessments does this mean that further pressure has been put on the next stage of the process and have waiting lists gone up for people waiting to receive therapies because they've moved from you know the waiting for to the i think i think you're right but which they, they're right in, in thinking that but what we're trying to do with any of our other services did not require that autism diagnosis in order to, to receive therapy, for example. So we wouldn't, would hope to not necessarily see that additional pressure because if you required OT, for example, you could be referring for that in regardless of your, your diagnosis status anyway. So hopefully you, you can have both concurrently going on at the same time. Yeah, it's those things, isn't it, where um, as parents, you're frequently told, you know, we, you haven't got a diagnosis. It's the things where you're waiting for that piece of paper and we're hoping it's going to open a door for us. And sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And sometimes when you when you get the door opened, you just open it to another queue. And I think, you know, that's that's what that is sort of picking up on. Okie dokie. OK. I think we've gone through your questions, Tom. Thanks, everyone. I've got another one for you, Alistair. Um, so it's about it's about it's about the minutiae again of, of how the system works. So if if um, I previously asked if alerts would be raised by the hub if timeframes were not being met, and we were told yes. But what did the caseworkers do with these alerts? Personally, we're weeks late on issuing a draft, but we haven't even had all the assessments. So the alerts are just automated from the system um, in terms of an email, et cetera. Um, in terms of what happens with it, it's kind of a, not a, there's not a universal answer to that. It depends on the individual and also what the circumstances are. If it's that, obviously, if, we're, if it's been delayed in some sort of way because we're awaiting for a really crucial piece of information, uh, then even as that time is approaching beyond doing chases to those particular providers, be that a school or an education psychologist or a therapist, um, it becomes a balancing question of, do I move the assessment forward to decide, shall I issue a plan knowing I'm missing a speech and language report, for example, um, or do I wait? Um, so in terms of what an individual person does, it's, it's sort of unique to what that specific situation is that's led to that time uh, coming close or going beyond its deadline. Um, we are keeping a close eye on those um, <clears throat> and there's a piece of work going on at the moment um, to ensure that as a whole service we're keeping a much closer eye on those times that are, are passing us by. Um, primarily to make sure, as you can imagine, uh, to make, ensure we're making decisions in a timely manner. Um, because once something's gone late, it's, it, it just makes things much more difficult for everyone involved, um, not least families, um, but it doesn't make things easier for us as a service either. So if we can catch those things uh, before that time has passed, uh, of course we want to do that. Uh, so our statistics are improving already uh, around our timeliness and we're getting 
uh, positive feedback from practitioners and also schools who are seeing right from the beginning of the assessment process things being done in a much more timely manner. We had over the last year or so a quite an accumulation of children going through the assessment process. Um, so what, because there's a sort of unnaturally large amount of children in it, because that those children accumulated in the process, um, it's proving challenging to get those children uh, through the assessment process in a timely manner. Um, but we're absolutely focused on making sure that we can improve those because as I say, everyone involved, you as families, schools, practitioners, and us as a local authority, everything becomes just extra complicated if things are running behind because we're then having to keep an eye on things running late, not whereas actually the assessment process, as many of you will probably already know, is not the simplest um, um, is not the simplest process for anyone to go through when it's happening in, in as it should in a timely manner. So if things are running late, it just makes a, what can be quite a complicated process even more complicated. I think, I think the we thing don't is, want to do it? that for anybody. Twenty weeks sounds like a long time. <clears throat> it's a huge amount of a school year, and and it's a huge you know. And I think you know, mm. twenty weeks is long <laughs> enough to wait, let alone. Mm. It, it is, and I think the the challenge that lots of local authorities have encountered, for those people who may re recall back when we used to do statements pre-2014, um, and a statement covered only education, so it didn't cover health or social care, the time window that a local authority had to complete a statement was 26, 26. weeks, which seems, <clears throat> I couldn't try and justify or explain what happened in terms of the thinking that we could do even more with less time was but that, that was not for me to try and explain the, the, the thinking was to put the parents and the families at the forefront and that actually 26 weeks is half a year that was the thinking but um, yes, and what could but we sh to, what could we shave off it and you know six weeks is the nominal number that they came up with but indeed indeed uh and uh you know the the success or otherwise of that uh, is seen through the national statistics. But there's a suggestion from a parent but, uh, here is if, if we're struggling to meet assessments, can we not outsource them? So th I suppose the question there is if you're outsourcing assessments, uh, and it's and it depends what part of the assessment it is. Um, in terms of people seeing individual practitioners, that's not causing us a significant issue at the moment. Uh, we're not fi we're not finding ourselves in a position where. Um, that is the principal cause of any delay. Uh, the principal area that things start to slow down and become difficult is at the end of the assessment process where we're collating information together uh, and drafting EHC plans. That doesn't mean that there's no one going through the assessment process where there is a, a shortage of particular practitioners or where things are taking a longer than it should do to see, for example, an educational psychologist, but that's not the standout issue in the process. Um, but we keep a close eye on that as well, because we, we, we obviously as a service rely on a lot of other agencies to support us with the process. So if we're finding that those sort of issues are arising, we tend to have regular contact with those various providers to make sure that we're doing all we can to assist them to do their work in a timely manner. And likewise, they're doing all their, they can to assist us with getting the information to us as swiftly as possible as well. Um, so it, we're very mindful that those things are issues. It, we're not, not nearly used a double negative. I wouldn't want anyone to feel as though we're not doing anything about those things because we, we can't not do anything about it because it, otherwise the problem would just snowball. There are things being done to make sure that there are improvements in these processes, because as I say, and I've, I've said a couple of times, it makes everybody's life more difficult when these things aren't happening as they should do. Parents um, ask, what's the likely overall delay? Or perhaps, let's ask it another way, Alistair, what's the average time it's taking to complete an EHCP assessment at the moment from start to completion? That's a question I don't have the answer to in terms of an, the, the average, because I don't sit directly within the operational okay. team. Um, but I can I certainly think find that out for you, you know, People like want it. to know, how long can I of expect? Course. Because 
you know, if I think about myself and, and my next stage of my daughter's journey, I need to know and I need to start putting the pressure on because it's really important that you, you get through it. So that's why people ask if they if the expectation is it's going to take me 52 weeks, then they know when to start the process. Um, yeah. Super. Thanks. Alistair. I can get that back to you, though, those specific. Yeah, I, 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 that, I think that would be something that, you know, that that expectation of how long people should expect to wait that, you know, the current likely delay is 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 really important and um, someone said does the hub not give time scales i think the i think mm -hmm. alistair will correct me but the, the time scale the time scales what they should be as opposed to what they currently are uh the time well the time scales from the hub are specific to an individual child yeah we use it. that data to work out our averages yes so that information is readily available i just don't have it readily available in my head <laughs> not really super thanks all um I know that some of these bits we could pull apart for ages and ages. Alistair has put it out there that if you are finding issues with accessibility or other issues on the hub, um, please do stick them in the chat and I will pass them on to Alistair. Um, Thank you. Likewise, as a couple of bits that came up um, more personal that Alistair said, you know, if, if you want to pass them on to me, I'll pull them out of the chat. Um, just a couple of bits going forward that you might be interested in over the next couple of weeks. We've got an HPCN Sendias clinic next wednesday which is all about back to school i i don't know more than that but it, it's all about what you can expect from from school i believe and then going forward to tuesday the 28th we've got our parent-led engagement session which I mean, this has ended up being a little bit like that but our parent-led engagement sessions we don't have a theme at all that's you come along and we have the professionals there and we can talk a little bit more about um we don't say they're personal situations. We need to talk generically, but we can get more in depth into, into bits and pieces. Alistair quite often comes along to those for us. Um, so those are there. So I appreciate that you haven't unmiked and said anything to us today. Are you, did you have anything or are you just happy to float and listen in? Unmute. Oh, I can unmute. And I attend because I know that sometimes things come along and if there's nobody here from social care, you don't get an answer. So I'm quite happy to listen if there's no particular questions, but Thank you. Thinking about the last time we had a presentation here, so over the weeks and months, we've had a few presentations from the Family Support Service. We've had somebody come along and talk about the Occupational Therapy Service. We have somebody come along and talk about the short breaks consultation. So if there is anything that you would particularly like, either an update on or information about at the next session if if people want to feed back to you or give ideas to you i'll, I'll tell you the thing that comes up in my get togethers sue and it's 16 plus oh and okay. what ha what happens when a child goes to college and there's only three days of college and the other two days get passed over to and what the whole process is with that because i see that coming up regularly okay so that might be an interesting one yeah and i can talk to um the independent futures team and see if they can come along with us because obviously they contribute to that with us so um I'll flag it and we'll see if we can get something ready for the next time we meet. Brilliant. Super. Thanks ever so much, everyone. It's, it's you know, it's lovely. I had one of these this morning where I was I was trying to get under fives along. If anyone knows parents of under fives that would want to come to a get together, please send them to me because I sat there for an hour on my own this morning. Um, which is, and I think I think there are groups that we fail to reach as HPC. And the problem is we're then marketing an event through a, through a you know, a social media to people who don't reach the social media. So um, I think it's a group that that, you know, would really benefit from the opportunity to come together. Have you asked Scott Hickman if he can help? Yes, yeah, oh, it's, it's funny. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Sometimes yeah, it's hard yeah. to get something new off the ground, but you know, we will, we will continue. Thank you very much to Alistair, Tom and Sue for your time. Thank you for all the parents for joining us because you know, we wouldn't have a session without you guys here. And I hope I will see you again next month. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>